Well, like I mentioned this morning, we're going to be following up on the theme that was introduced, even, on Christ's love for the church. His love, his care, and particularly his sacrifice for the church. You remember uh, the text we looked at proving that for us really well, and it was Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 through 27. So I'm going to start and read that again to catch us up so we might be reminded of the great lengths that Christ has gone for us, for the church. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. We see here in this passage the great love and the great lengths that Christ went to show his love for the church by dying for the church. And I want to continue to consider that. And I want to consider that as believers here in this room. If you're a believer here with me, I want to be considering something as it relates to this great work of Christ. I've got a question for you. How much have you earned? I really want you to think about it right now. How much have you earned? I've got a pretty good idea about how much I've earned. But how much have you earned? Now, I'm not asking about your bank account or your salary or that paycheck that comes in every other week or once a month. No, I'm, t- I'm talking about a different kind of earnings. Not the positive kind that we look forward to for our hard work, but a negative kind of earnings. How much have you earned? The Bible says in the first part of Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. This means that all mankind, every one of us, have been accumulating wages throughout our entire lives. We've been storing up for ourselves wages that will earn us the wrath of God. If you're 20 years old today, you've got 20 years of accumulating sin to your account. 30 years old, 40, 50 years old. If you're 50, you've got a 50-year pension plan, wages of sin, 70, 80, 90. No matter how long you've been alive, that's how long you've been accumulating and earning for yourselves wages, wages of sin. Well, we sin whenever we break God's law and commandments both physically, outwardly, and also mentally, right? Even in our thoughts. Not only every evil deed, but also every evil thought and intention. Jesus tells us on the Sermon on the Mount, if you remember, that even lust, lustful thoughts, and hatred, hateful intentions, are sins, though there may not be any outward act or transgression in the matter. You see, our sin permeates deeper than what other people see on the outside. We also sin, just to add to the wages, when we, when we don't give God the worship and glory that He deserves. He is the only being who deserves to be worshipped regularly, consistently, always. So that when His creatures who He created, when 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 people created as in his, his image do not worship God and glorify God and thank God in all that they do, 
uh, when they go on vacation, but they just don't consider God, when they go about their jo- day and their jobs, but they're not considering God, when they live their lives completely void of thinking about, considering, praising, thanking, praying to God. You know what? That's also sin. And if we consider this evening the great weight of sin that we've all accumulated throughout our lives, let me tell you, if we just think about it, as I asked you, it would crush us. It would so weigh us down in despair and even depression and overwhelming, just how overwhelming it all is because we have a lot of sin and a lot of wages throughout our lives. That's why many of us, many times, most of the time, we don't like to think about our sin. We'd rather just sweep it under the rug, close our eyes to the reality of our sin, plug our ears to the reality of our sin, and just pretend it didn't even happen. But you see, we serve and know that there is a holy, sovereign, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And by very definition of Him being God means that we can't hide from Him. We can't hide our sins from Him because He knows us. He knows all of our sin. He knows all of our wages. He knows all of it. Now you might be asking, why, oh why, Daniel? Why in the world would you drudge up this rather discouraging conversation and bring up these rather discouraging thoughts of your lifetime of sin. Well, the reason I bring up these wages, it has everything to do with what Jesus did on the cross. And he even said so. Let me prove it to you. John chapter 28, I mean, John chapter 19 and verses 28 through 30 says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What was finished? He said, it is finished because he was finished bearing the wrath of God in the place of you. Believer, if you are a Christian here this evening. It has everything to do, your wages, has everything to do with the cross. And add to that, your wages also have everything to do with Him and His love and His care and His sacrifice for the bride of Christ, the church, in giving Himself up for her to cleanse her from her sin and guilt from her wages. You see, Jesus came into the world to deal with your wages, my wages. That is the very reason he was born, as it says in Mark chapter 1 and 21, to save his people from their sins. This was no accident, but his plan of dying on the cross was according to a divine orchestrated plan and in Isaiah 53 we even see that it was the father's will to crush the suffering servant this was in God's plan this is what Jesus did willingly the lamb led to the slaughter for our wages and Jesus even on three accounts at least in his earthly ministry that we see in the gospels predicted and foretold his death to the disciples and let them know beforehand that he was going to die. 
This was not a bad, just bad day for Jesus. It wasn't just bad luck at the wrong place at the wrong time. A passerby looking by, looking at the cross, or it, probably thinking, wow, it's a bad day for, for him and the others on the cross. Uh, tough luck for them. But that is not so with Christ because this was intentional. This was his plan. Jesus came to die as a substitute for sinners. The wages that we've accumulated throughout our whole lives have been paid for by Christ. And let me tell you, if they weren't paid for by Christ, you know who they'd be paid for? By? They'd be paid for by us. An eternal conscious punishment in hell. Do you see... The idea of his death saves us from so much. It saves us from our guilt and our wages so that we don't have to go pay the penalty for our sins, but instead Christ might bear the wrath of the Father on our behalf, condemned in our place, though he was sinless. He went to the cross to pay for the believer's Wages. Praise God for this. This is the good news of the gospel, and we ought to rejoice in this gospel message. In our place, condemned, he stood. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. He took our sin. He took our punishment. He paid for our wages. This is the gospel. Now to be clear here, I must be clear on this this evening. I do not want to be misunderstood. Jesus did not die on the cross to just die for sin in general. Sin out there. Kind of just sin. Just faceless sin. Actless sin. No, just sin in general. No, it is much more personal than that. It's not this abstract thing. It's all about those wages you were thinking about before. For individual sinners and individual sins... If you did not have a substitute who actually paid for your sins, your wages, you would have. So therefore, by implication, if he was going to be a substitute to pay for our wrath and our sin and our wages, then by implication, you had to be in his mind on the cross. He had to actually be dying for your sins on the cross. Do you see how personal and glorious and wonderful that that is? He died for his bride, for his church. It's a specific love for a specific people, for specific sins. This is so wonderful. When we get a glimpse of it, we just continue to glory on it our whole lives as the Christians. We never get sick of that. We never forget about that. We always love the work that he's done for us because we know how messed up we are and how lost we would be without him. We'd be in trouble because we got a lot of wages. If you're an unbeliever here with us this evening, I don't ever want to take it for granted just because people come to church. But they are just, because they're here, believers. You heard from my testimony this morning, Sunday school. Sometimes people have a profession of faith, go to church, but they did, have never believed the gospel. They've never had newness of life. They've never been converted. So if you're an unbeliever here with us this evening, the Bible tells us that you are still in your sins and that you are still right now under God's wrath. You will pay for your own sins in hell, your wages, 
if you don't trust Christ. But it's not too late for you. It's never too late this side of heaven because the Bible tells us that anyone who believes in Christ and trusts the gospel and repents of their sins as, uh, and sees Jesus as the only substitute for sinners, the only way of forgiveness, the only way that our sins might be covered, that our wages might be forgiven. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, in verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the, one, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So if you're an unbeliever with us, and maybe even for the first time are seeing your wages of sin, recognizing Jesus, I want to tell you that you too, even this evening, can know what it's like to have a Savior say about your sins, about your wages, it is finished. And you, too, can know what it's like to say alongside King David in Psalm 32, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And you, too, could know what it's like to be a part of the church who has been bought by the price of Christ's death because he died for her. You, too, can know that if you just believe the gospel. Oh, I pray that that might be the case for you. Now, for those of you who are believers here with me this evening, I had you also think about your wages so that you can be reminded of all that Jesus has done for you and for your salvation. And I don't right now by what I'm going to say. I do not want to trivialize at all. Your pain. Your sorrow. Your trials. Oh, your anxieties. Whatever it is that's going on in your life. I do not want to be trivializing that in what I say. But let me tell you this, and this is true. I believe that it's true. I'm thankful for that it's true for me. That no matter how bad things are in your life, how stressful, how chaotic, how anxious you might be, if you are a believer, that means that you have a substitute for the wages of your sin. That means that your biggest problem, that's all of our biggest problem, a separation between a holy God and us. That's our biggest problem. Our sin and guilt. And the fact that we are guilty before our creator and will be judged for it. That's our biggest problem. We have many problems. We may have many problems, but that's our biggest problem. If you are a believer here this evening, that means your wages, your sin, that has all been dealt for, covered by Christ before a holy God, because Christ went to the cross for your sins. And all of our sins, you see, they were nailed to the cross. And you see, we bear them no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh, our souls. The hymn goes. Worship Christ in light of these glories of the gospel this evening. He, he doesn't just save sinners in general. This impersonal thing. No. He saved you. Actual sinners. Who have much guilt and many wages. He saves sinners like us. By fully covering the penalty of our sins. He is the great high priest. He is the great and true substitute. He is the sacrificial 
lamb who laid down his life for us and for our salvation. Rejoice with me. Rejoice together in the Savior. So I ask you again to consider in light of what has been said tonight, how much have you earned? And oh, for the believer, how much then has Christ earned and accomplished for you? Let's pray. Our Father and our great God, we come before you just marveling in the gospel, thankful for all that you've done for us and for our salvation. You didn't have to do what you did by sending your son to the world to be born in a humble manger, to live a perfect life on our behalf, and then to die a substitutionary death for our sins, and then to be raised on the third day from the grave Oh, Lord, you didn't have to do that for us. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We deserve the opposite. We had accumulated so much. But even in spite of that, you sent your son to die for sinners like us. And for that, we are so thankful. I'm thankful for those who I know are believers here that I've met and I've seen great evidence of your grace in their lives. I've seen how the gospel has transformed their lives, and I'm so thankful for these brothers and sisters here. Oh, Lord, that you saved them from their sins. Thankful, oh, Lord, that you saved me from my sins. And we pray, Father, for all of those, the, maybe the little ones who have not yet believed, they're continuing to be disciples, Maybe the people here who maybe have a profession of faith but have never been converted, have never been born again, we pray, oh, we pray for them as well. Oh, Lord, that you might save them from their sins so that they might have a freedom from the guilt that they deserve. Not because they deserve your grace, but because you graciously give your grace Oh, to these sinners, I pray, Father, that you might save some even this evening, oh God, and that you would allow all of us to be a part of the mission in this world, in this town, all over the place of proclaiming this great gospel message to everyone we meet, because this is truly the best news that any of us know. Oh God, let it be on our hearts. Let it be on our lips. Oh, let us glorify you in all things. And oh, we just one more time thank you for your grace and your mercy in saving us from our sins. And we say this all in Christ's name. Amen.